source of political news, something that remains unchanged today for most Woody Woo majors. As quirky boss Michael Scott from the hit TV series The Office, he has made us laugh and cringe with moments more awkward than pre-frosh weekend. As a 40-year-old virgin, he showed us that it was okay for Princeton students to spend more time in the library than in the bedroom. <laughs> As the voice of Gru in this, the animated film Despicable Me, he made finance and consulting seem not that bad by comparison. <laughs> we have watched him as a news anchor, a weatherman, a Proust scholar, the mayor of Whoville, and a hyperactive squirrel that put Princeton's own squirrels to shame. <laughs> Tina Fey once said that he owns that's what she said, and I can confirm that he in fact owns the trademark on that phrase. <laughs> His humor and career have without a doubt defined the pop culture of our generation. He has been the fuel for countless hours of procrastination, and for that we owe him our thanks. <laughs> we may have said, good said goodbye to our carols forever, but it's my pleasure and honor to introduce... <laughs> to present the 2012 Class Day keynote speaker, Steve Carell. Thank you very much. Faculty, parents, friends, family, graduates. I am extremely honored to be here today. As some of you may know, Princeton is one of the world's great universities, a place of intellectual and artistic excellence, a bastion of knowledge, a football powerhouse. <laughs> I don't aspire to change the world with my words this morning. I think we can all agree that most of these class day speeches are forgotten almost as soon as they are delivered. Witness Brooke Shields, <laughs> and especially Stephen Colbert. <laughs> he is the worst. <laughs> I can only hope that this address will resonate for generations to come, that your children and your children's children will continue to reap the benefits of what I have sown here today. <laughs> I'd like you all to do something for me right now. I would like you to turn and look to the person on your left. <laughs> now I'd like you to turn and look to the person on your right. What do we learn from this exercise? <laughs> we learn that nobody looks each other in the eyes anymore. <laughs> As human beings, we should naturally crave contact with one another, but sadly, as the world grows more and more technologically advanced, we lose our ability to connect as human beings. The internet. <laughs> Texting. Tweeting. Email, email, Gmail, I chat. Facebook, FaceTime, LOL, TMI. <laughs> NSFW. <laughs> OMFG. <laughs> LMFAO. <laughs> when I was in college, I would not text a girl to ask her out on a date. I would ask her in person, one human to another. When she said no, which she always did, I would suffer the humiliation and self-loathing that a young man needs for his or her personal growth. <laughs> a text does nothing more than protect us. It protects us. <laughs> If you will. <laughs> to keep us safe. It is like a warm blanket that insulates us from the truth. The truth of how unappealing I was to Amy Miller. <laughs> well, look at me now, Amy! Last day speaker at Princeton! <laughs> Suck on that! <laughs> My point is, I suffered 
and you should have to suffer too. <laughs> when I was in college, we had libraries with actual books. I had a library card with which I could borrow a book, take that book home, read that book, eventually forget that I had that book, and then never return that book. <laughs> Unlike a Kindle or an iPad, books had a certain smell, a certain feel. They had their own fascinating history. Countless readers before me had touched that book, breathed on it, stuck their gum between the pages, maybe left Dorito fingerprints. A book was perspiration and flakes of dead skin and dandruff. It was the DNA of generations of college students before me. And like bowling shoes, it's best not to think about it. <laughs> Books were magical back then. When I was in college, if we didn't know something, we didn't Google it. We just made an educated guess. <laughs> or we made it up. We pretended that we knew, and that was good enough. <laughs> If a person believed that they were right, it was just as good as actually being right. And if you weren't right, you could leave before anyone had time to check your facts. Those days are gone now. Everybody knows everything. I googled myself this morning. Yeah, woo! I know, I know, it sounds like a euphemism for something gross. <laughs> and it should, I suppose, because it too is an exercise in self-love. <laughs> so, so I googled myself, I looked up my name, Susan. curious to see what others might be saying about me. And you know what I found? Lies. <laughs> Conjecture, half-truth. And then I went on Facebook. More of the same internet mendacity, groundless accusations, blatant falsehoods, gross inaccuracies, hurtful slander. So hurtful, in fact, that I had to take the painful but necessary step of unfriending my 86-year-old mother. <laughs> That's her problem. When I was in college, we didn't have cell phones. We had a dormitory landline. We didn't call home very much. It was expensive and inconvenient. These days, the modes of communication are many and varied. Kids and their parents are in constant contact. When I was in college, I would call my parents for three reasons. When I needed money, when I was thinking about changing my major, and when I got a person pregnant. <laughs> Today, parents are much more attuned to their children's college experience. But I wonder, is this right? Isn't college supposed to be the time when you go from hating your parents to simply not caring about them? <laughs> when I was in college, we didn't have Facebook, we had a phone book. And we didn't use Twitter. We used good old-fashioned gossip. If you wanted to talk about someone, you could do it face to face, right behind their back. <laughs> Haven't forgotten the beauty of a handwritten letter, lovingly delivered three to six weeks later. But do we no longer need the encyclopedia, almost 300 pounds of readily accessible knowledge? Have we lost touch with our simpler selves? I believe we have. And by we, I mean you. <laughs> you are young. And because of that, you are wrong. Can <laughs> we just for a moment embrace our analog past? Is it possible to escape the constant barrage of electronic information? Wouldn't it be nice to not receive 17 emails a day from Michael Yaroshevsky? <laughs> A few years ago, I bought a tiny 150-year-old general store in Massachusetts. A Norman Rockwell study, really. Here, kids buy penny candy and ice cream. Their parents drop by for a cup of coffee and to say hello to, their, and to, uh, to, say hello to their neighbors. It is a place of community, a place of true human connection and kinship. When it came up for sale, there was a real danger that this wonderful piece of history would cease to exist, so I bought it. 
I didn't buy it for financial gain. God knows, there's not a lot of money in penny candy. And I didn't buy it to preserve it as a local landmark. I bought this quaint little anachronism because I wanted people to think I was a really nice guy. <laughs> a kind, generous, giving man who cares about history and about the people in this little Massachusetts town. I am not that man. <laughs> Unfortunately, people think that I am. And that's what we need more of these days. <laughs> Perceived heroes. <laughs> Heroism is not about doing heroic things. Heroism is about how heroic other people believe you should be. I could go visit some sick children in the hospital, but if there aren't any cameras there, did it really happen? <laughs> Who would I really be helping aside from those in need? <laughs> in the woods and no one is there, does the tree get credit? <laughs> What does it do for the tree? <laughs> yeah, just think about that. <laughs> Doug Davis! <laughs> Doug Davis is a hero. He scored a buzzer-beating shot to defeat Harvard and win the Ivy League. Do we need to examine Doug Davis's motivations in winning the game? Does Doug Davis strive for excellence selflessly, or does he do great things for the recognition, the accolades, and the reverence like a normal human being? <laughs> I can't answer that because I don't know Doug Davis. Doug Davis doesn't even sound like a real name. <laughs> Davis seeks the love of others because he has not yet learned to love himself. <laughs> but that, of course, is purely conjecture. <laughs> when I was about to graduate from college, I was preparing to enter law school. I remember that I was filling out my application to Stanford, and I came to the essay question, which was, why do you want to be an attorney? And I really had no idea. It sounded good. My parents had worked extraordinarily hard to give me a great education, and I felt that I owed it to them to give them some sort of valid career choice. So I sat down with them and asked them what they thought, and they proceeded to give me the best advice that I had ever received or would ever receive. Their words were profound and wise, and they completely altered the rest of my life. They said... Something like, blah, 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 follow your dreams, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't remember exactly what they said. I did not go to law school. It was ultimately the right choice for me. I, I wouldn't have been happy as an attorney, and they knew it. They also understood that it was my future, my life. And they very wisely advised me to do what I knew I already wanted to do. As Harry Truman once said, the best way to give advice to your children is to find out what they want and then advise them to do it. In conclusion, I would like to leave you with a few random thoughts, not advice per se, but some helpful hints. Show up on time, because to be late is to show disrespect. Remember the words regime and regimen are not interchangeable. <laughs> Get a dog, because cats are lame. <laughs> Only use a that's what she said joke if you absolutely cannot resist. <laughs> Never try to explain a that's what she said joke to your parents. <laughs> when you eat out, tip on the entire check. Do not subtract the tax first. <laughs> and every once in a while, put something positive into the world. We've become so cynical these days, and by we, I mean us. So, so do something kind, make somebody laugh, and don't take yourself too seriously. Congratulations, Maggie. Congratulations, Classic 2012.